functions. So basically, a neuron in a rat's brain can be approximated by any function which can be represented as a sum of weighted Boltzmann functions. So it's kind of like a, a Fourier transform, almost, that's going on here. Um, so what, what are the class of these functions? Well, the stone weierstrass theorem says that if you have a, a finite interval, this can pretty much approximate any continuous function over the interval, which is kind of cool. So essentially, a single neuron, okay, one neuron in your brain can implement any function of the form dv dt equals f of t. Okay, so it can implement any first order differential equation over some interval, uh, as long as f is a continuous function over some interval, which is kind of cool. I mean, it's like, you know, you have a lot of neurons, you know, you have like 10 to the 11th neurons, each one of which can, uh, can implement any differential equation, uh, which <laughs> pretty much shows that, you know, the, the literally astronomical ability of your brain to do computations. Uh, it's almost unlimited what your brain can do. Okay, so do any of these things have multiple solutions? Yeah. So suppose we have, it, for f, we use 2 times the square root of v. So dv dt equals 2 times the square root of v. This equation, this first order differential equation, has two different solutions. It has a solution where vt equals 0 for all time, and then it has another solution, a whole family of solutions, actually, that for any time t sub 0, uh, it just starts ramping up as n squared. Now, compare this with Norton's dome example. This is quite the same. Okay, the ball can, like, remain poised at the top of the dome for all time, or at any time, it can just start randomly rolling down. Same thing for this equation, okay? It can stay at 0 forever, or it can just, like, start randomly ramping up. Okay, let me diagram it out here, okay? The voltage of the neuron could be zero for any length of time. And then, non-deterministically, it just starts ramping up. It just picks a time and just starts ramping up. Okay? So, the question becomes, is there any series of Boltzmann weights like this such that, one, they're biologically plausible, right? I mean, it makes no sense to talk about things that are, like, totally beyond the pale here. And two, the, the Hodgkin's-Huxley equation, which I've redrawn here, approximates to this 2 times the square root of v, okay? The answer is yes to both scores, uh, amazingly enough. And I actually verified that these are biologically plausible um, values that we're getting here, okay? This, this neuron could actually exist. Now, the question is how to find them, though, right? Uh, the stone weierstrass theorem says they exist, but it doesn't say how many of them we need, and it doesn't say exactly how to find them we need a biologically plausible mechanism to generate them. All right, what could that mechanism possibly be? Ah, uh, let's try evolution. <laughs> so we'll assume with Hodgkin's Huxley that, that uh, we can approximate this neuron with only three ion channels, and we'll choose a scale where c equals one. Then the equation reduces to the following. Okay, dv dt equals the sum of three of these weighted Boltzmann functions. And then, the, the kicker just becomes finding the right values of A1, B1, and K1 in order to do this, right? So, so how can we do this with evolution? Well, we'll assume that the value of each one of these constants uh, is controlled by a different gene in the genome. And then we'll just say, okay, we'll simulate the process of evolution here by starting out with the organism which has an arbitrary value for these guys. I start out with these values in my, my computer simulation. And then every generation, what we'll do is we'll pick one of the constants and we'll mutate it by just a little bit, add a random delta to the function, right? And then we'll apply a selection function to it. If the equation becomes closer to being equal to, to our target uh, equation, we'll accept the mutation and we'll let it make more babies. If not, we reject the mutation, right? So basically what we're just trying to do is we're trying to simulate this. We're trying to show that this neuron can evolve. Uh, by using natural selection. Okay, so uh, how do we measure the closeness? Well, closeness to, to dvdt, basically what I did was I took on the interval 0 to 1 milliseconds, which is the interval that we want to approximate this for. Basically, I just evaluated both of the functions, the target function and the guest function, and then I did a, a least squares distance between the two of them. And uh, if, 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 if the least squares distance uh, you know, decreased, then I accepted the mutation. So I simulate this with a C++ program. It's a very simple program. It's just under 300 lines of code. 
and on my 2.2 gigahertz MacBook Pro, I can simulate several million generations in just a few minutes. And um, lo and behold, it works. Okay, the solution just rapidly uh, converges to the goal. Okay, now here's a graph of, of what I've got there. Okay, see the target function, 2 times the square root of v. Okay, now between the, the two um, vertical red bars there is our desired region of convergence. That's the region from 0 to 1 uh, milliseconds and 0 to 1 millivolts is where I want to this neuron to simulate the uh, simulate the, the non-deterministic behavior. So 2 times the square root of v is the, is the target function and uh, I've plotted the results of several of these generations as it keeps evolving and you can see it converges to the solution. So let me uh, zoom in on the uh, zoom in on the on the thing here. Okay so the target function is 2 times the square root of v and after 100k generations, it's it's pretty close, but it's still far off. 200k generations, 300k generations, you see it's like closing in on the solution that's there. Okay? So here's the final one that I got. And um, the target function and the evolved solution, you see in the desired region of convergence, they're exactly the same. Okay? Uh, here I've, I've kind of made the gray box be the desired region of convergence. The least square is error for this, for the evolved solution is... Uh, less than 3 uh, times 10 to the minus 5, well within the experimental error of the Hodgkins-Huxley equation. So, so here's the bottom line. It is possible to get forms of the Hodgkins-Huxley model of the neuron, which are, within experimental error, non-deterministic. And the value for the constants and the Boltzmann weights are very biologically plausible. Okay, and even cooler, if there's a selective pressure for these kind of neurons, they will evolve. So, I mean, the whole thing from top to bottom is very biologically plausible. Um, you know, if, if there actually is an advantage to having free will, I mean, it probably will be evolved sooner or later. So I'm going to venture this, this following bold hypothesis, right? Now, this is a the high scientific hypothesis. I could be proven wrong on this one, okay? Somewhere in our 10 to the 11th neurons, scientists will find neurons which exhibit non-deterministic behavior, okay? And I'm not just talking about chaos. You know, any nonlinear system has this kind of chaotic behavior that's, that's there. But um, now I'm talking about genuine non-determinism. I mean, really the real thing, real non-determinism, okay? Ergo, we are non-deterministic. Ergo, we are not stimulus response machines. That's my bold hypothesis, okay? This is a falsifiable hypothesis, okay? I reserve the right to be wrong on this one, okay? And if you want to, go prove me wrong. Please do, okay? Or prove me right. Go find these neurons, okay? But in any case, I, I think the reason we aren't finding these solutions is because we're just not looking for them. We're just under the control of this paradigm, which is just... It's trapped progress, right? The reason we're not finding non-deterministic neurons is we're, not, we're just not looking for them. So I think if we go look for them, I think we'll actually find